So we're going to be in Jude, verses 17 through 25 this morning as we finish up our series, Unfollow. We've been spending five weeks going through this short, often ignored book, verse by verse, to really understand Jude and to apply Jude to our lives. Now, Jude says some difficult things, and if any book be allowed to tell us difficult things, shouldn't that be the Bible? The Bible is constantly scrutinized. The world around us tries to discount and discredit the Bible. And the church that doesn't know and doesn't live by the Bible is going to be a church that will ultimately unfollow Jesus. And this is why we're spending so much time with this often ignored letter of the New Testament. Because we don't want to unfollow the one that we've been called to follow. As your pastor, I don't want you to let the world sneak into your mind and lead you away. And so I'm using Jude, I'm using the Bible, to point out to you how false teachers will attempt to lead you to follow your own desires, your own opinions, your own feelings, your own thoughts, and your own sin. No one is immune to the temptation of following a false teacher or false teaching. So let's look at Jude 17 through 25. Again, our practice throughout this series is to look at the English Standard Version and also the New Living Translation as we look at what Jude is writing. Let's look at the ESV, the English Standard Version, first. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the Apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, build, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So that's the English Standard Version. That's a word-for-word translation. Let's look at the New Living Translation. It's in your notes as well. This is a meaning-for-meaning or a thought-for-thought translation. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's Spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away, and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the presence and beyond all time. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this word to us this morning in Jude. Thank you for what you've written to us, and we praise God. We praise you. We praise Jesus. All glory, majesty, and power and authority are yours before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Help us to look at your word this morning and apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we finish up Jude this morning, in verses 17 through 19, we look at what is happening. The apostles 
had been warning the church that false teachers are a reality for the church. Not a possibility, but a reality. A fact that the church will have to deal with. Jude devotes this whole letter to false teachers and what the church should do about them. Paul addresses the Ephesian elders in Acts, the, Ephesian, the pastors of the Ephesian church in Acts 20, in 26 through 30. This is what Paul writes. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul is thinking about false teachers here as he's writing to the Ephesian church. He also warns Timothy about false teachers in the church. Peter deals with these predictions of false teachers affecting the church, as does John in 1 John. Jude says in his letter here that the last times or in the last days, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. In your notes, we are living in the last days. The last days are now. Now don't get too excited. That doesn't mean the end is near. When, we are, when I say we are living in the last times or the last days, it's not that the end is near so much as the last days or the last times refers to the time that's in between Jesus' first appearance and his final appearance. And so we're in that time, and so we are in the last days. Now they could continue for hundreds of more years, maybe thousands, or Jesus could return before our church service is over this morning. But during this time between Christ's appearances, there will be false teachers. The apostles say there will be. Scripture says there will be false teachers impacting, affecting the church. Jude's last words about false teachers are this. They are following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions. Worldly people devoid of the Spirit. False teachers, in your notes, follow their desires and instincts. And it results in division. Because false teachers are not true believers... They only know their own desires. They only know their instincts. And when you mix that in with a group of believing Christians who are hearing somebody teach stuff, but it's not from God, you get division to bubble up. Confusion sets in. Now Jude spends much of his letter addressing the very real problem of false teachers. But now, as we finish up this letter, he's turning his attention to his readers. He begins to instruct them on how to do differently. In Jude 20 through 23, he writes, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. And many New Testament authors will use this phrase, this term beloved, when they're writing to the churches that they helped found. And, and as I've gotten to know you guys over the past year and a half, my love for you continues to grow. And in my love for you, I want God's best for you. As your pastor, I want God's best for you. And I join with Jude and the other New Testament writers to point you to God's Word as His best for you. God's Word, the Bible, is the best thing for you. And as we live and respond to life that happens to us, we must use the Bible to help to respond and live life. So how do we do differently? If Jude is writing to us here, 
to do differently than the false teachers. How do we do that? Jude helps us with this. So here's how to do differently. This is right out of Jude. Four words I want you to remember. Build, pray, keep, wait. Remember those four terms. Build, pray, keep, wait. As you're thinking about life that's happening around you and you wonder, how can I go through this? How can I live through this and honor God and do uh, what God would want of me? These four terms can help you to associate what you should do. Build, pray, keep, and wait. Jude says to build yourself up in the faith. Grow in your understanding of God and his word to you. Study Jesus as he is revealed to you in the Bible. That is how you build. You build yourself up in the faith through God's word. Then pray. And what is prayer? Prayer is us speaking to God. And many times as we pray, we are coming to him because there's a situation that we can't get through. We don't know how to get through it. Or we're We're realizing we're limited, and so we come to God in prayer, realizing our powerlessness to change others, and we're trusting God to be God. Jude tells us to pray, but not only just to pray, but to pray in agreement with God's will. As believers, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. That is a promise that Jesus gives us, and it's a reality for Christians, is that we have the Holy Spirit within us. Listen to this from Paul in Romans 8, 26, and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is a big part of the Holy Spirit's ministry in the lives of Christians. Prayer. Jude tells us to pray. And as we pray, we must trust that the Spirit will do what the Spirit does. Jude continues to tell us to keep ourselves in the love of God. And by praying and growing in our understanding of God... We are able to keep ourselves in the love of God. Now, when we stop praying and we stop growing in our understanding, we are susceptible to being led away by a false teacher. Jude says to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. While we wait, we keep. As we keep, we're building and we're praying. This is what the Christian life is, really, as we remain. We continue following Jesus, and we hold on to what he's done for us and has given us. But our life is much more than just ourselves. And this is a a problem that the American church doesn't deal with very well. We think our faith is about ourselves. We think our understanding of God is between he and us. It's not. The beautiful thing about the church in these last times is that we exist as the church in part for each other. Jude helps us to understand this. And and he says that we are to help those who doubt. So in your notes, help those who doubt. Part of the Christian experience, I'm sure you're aware of, is doubt. Christians doubt. And that's okay. Doubt is real. It's not necessarily a sign of lack of faith. It's possibly a struggle to identify faith or to understand faith deeper. We doubt God. We doubt the Bible. We doubt each other. And Jude instructs us to have mercy on those who doubt. Help them. Don't attack them. Don't hurt them because of that doubt. Help them with mercy. Now, this is the same word, mercy, that we attribute to what we're waiting for from Jesus as we build, pray, keep, and wait. Another way of describing mercy is compassion. 
there is understanding and patience involved. A seeking to understand what someone is going through as they're doubting. And we wrap that up in care for the individual. In the church, we should be quick to help those who doubt. And since most of Jude's letter is dealing with false teaching, we can't assume that this mercy extends to those who are dealing with being led away by false teaching or being influenced by false teaching. As that false teaching creates doubt, we should have mercy on those who are doubting. Help those who've been influenced by false teaching with mercy. The best thing that we can do is to point people to God's word. When we know someone is dealing with a false teaching, the Bible is what they need. Not your opinion, not my opinion, not our thoughts, but what God's word says. The truth is found in the Bible. We show mercy when we lead people to the pages of scripture. But we must know the Bible to do this well. And that's part of the building that Jude is calling us to, is to grow in our understanding of God's word. It's all tied together. We must know the Bible for ourselves and for each other. Jude says that we should treat some people differently, though. Jude continues and says we should snatch some away. Snatch others with urgency in your notes. Now, there may be situations or circumstances where people are acting in a way that will lead to immediate destruction. There may not be time for another approach. Instead of trying to reason with them why it's a bad idea to go into a burning building unprepared, we are to snatch them, to grab them, to rescue them, to save them from the fire. Jude says, for their sake, snatch them out with urgency. This, this is mercy in a way, saving them from the destruction that awaits their current decision-making process. And others, Jude says, may need mercy with fear. Lastly, Jude says, is saying that you might need to do a mix of these two. Give mercy, but with fear. And I like the way the New Living Translation says this. It says, show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. This is where the idea of hate the sin and love the sinner comes from. But note, this is for Christians, not the world. At least that's what Jude is speaking of here. The context here is helping people who belong to faith, who are Christians, deal with life that is confused by false teaching. The Christian is living in a way that sin is presenting itself publicly, and Jude says to show mercy, but to hate the sin that is in their life. Now when you add up all this, when you put all this together, you get a really messy situation. False teachers confuse Christians, they create a mess. Christians, hearing false teaching, struggle to live according to what they're hearing. From everywhere that they hear it and then add our sinful nature we have a recipe for that messy situation then you multiply it by all the members of a church and you can see why so many churches are riddled with division strife and pain jude gives us good things to do here though but in all honesty though they're good we can't do them not not by ourselves not left to our own resources, or our own wisdom, or our own power. We just can't do the things Jude tells us to do. So what are we to do? Thankfully, Jude is not done. He has two more verses, and these two verses are the most popular verses in Jude. Listen to these beautiful words that Jude writes to close the letter in verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the, pres before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Jude writes a difficult letter describing the reality of some terrible things false teachers do inside a church. 
He gives us good practices as Christians to follow, but we're unable to if we're left to our own selves. So Jude points us to Jesus, who can and does do the things that we can't do. In your notes, Jesus is able. That's what Jude says. That's how he ends this letter. Jesus is able. We are weak. Jesus is strong. We are unsteady. Jesus is a firm foundation. We are broken. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is able. Jude says that Jesus is able to keep you from stumbling. Jesus can keep you from stumbling. When you follow Jesus, as he is revealed in his word, you can learn about him and how he leads those who follow him. As we follow Jesus, he keeps us from stumbling. Though we are in the last times, the last days, we don't know how much longer Jesus will tarry. No matter how long Jesus waits, in him, Christians are kept. Keeps us from stumbling. Jesus is also the one who presents us blameless to God. When you are presented to God, Jesus is the one who will present you blameless to him. And if you are in Christ, God will only see Jesus in you. Jesus presents you blameless. As a result of all, of all this, Jesus deserves our praise. Jesus deserves our highest praise forever. And this is where Jude ends. Jesus deserves an eternity of highest praise. It starts here and it will continue for time everlasting as we praise Jesus who keeps us and presents us. Jesus is able and we've walked through five weeks in Jude. And it has been a hard few weeks with harsh reality. And I've been tempted to cut this series short and just do something fun and light. But God has been faithful. God continues to be faithful to his word. And we are finishing this difficult letter with some of the most beautiful words ever written about Jesus. I'll invite the worship team to come back up. And as they come, consider Jesus. Consider what you're trying to do for him or for God. Consider in what strength you are attempting that. Perhaps someone has laid an unbiblical expectation on you and made it sound like it was from God. Maybe someone has hurt you because they've been listening to the wrong authority and you're wondering how to get through it. Jesus is able to get you through it. He is able to keep you from stumbling. He will present you blameless before God. Jesus deserves our praise. He deserves our devotion. He deserves our lives. Are you following Jesus? Will you stand as we close in prayer? God, we love you. We love Jesus and we thank you for him. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever.